Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Childs. I'm the Operations Director for COAPE. I want to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, Ideal and Involved Instruction Using Practitioner Expertise and Research with Distance and Blended Learning. Just so you know, within 24 hours after this webinar, you will receive an email with your certificate for CEU verification. You can visit our website at coib.org educators resource to learn more and find resources on this webinar. Also, we encourage you to visit our website educateandelevate.org and please take action to contact your legislator. As you know, in March, we have our national conference coming up in Phoenix, Arizona. If you haven't registered, register today to take advantage of our early bird registration. This will be from March 25th to 28th at the Sheraton Phoenix Downtown Hotel. More than 30 strands to choose from, including workforce strand, CTE strand, and the new adult learner strand. Our research of practice, Program management, as part of our research practice initiative, each webinar will, have, will be helping to answer common questions that adult educators have. This webinar will be helping to address the following questions. How to use learning technology to improve instruction and learning, and how to make learning technology effective for low literacy learners. Our COAB journal, in our fall 2014 issue, David Rosen and Rebecca Metzger wrote an article, Blended Learning Apps That Can Make You Flip. This can be found on our website at coib.org under the journal Past Issues. This webinar is made possible with the support of Burlington English. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Robert Breitbart from Burlington English. Well, hello everyone, and uh, so glad to see so many familiar faces out there. And uh, you, you folks are in for a real treat. Jen, Jen Vanek does an amazing job. And so uh, myself and all of my colleagues at Burlington English are super thrilled to be working with COABE uh, to bring you this uh, really powerful uh, webinar today. Um, very quickly, as we try to connect all of Burlington English with these different webinars, what is Burlington English? And Burlington English fits in so well with what uh, Dr. Jen's going to be talking about today. Uh, I always keep a bookshelf in my, uh, my office here because that's what Burlington English really brings you. Burlington brings you more than 50 courses and mini courses, all the way from the basics from a true beginner all the way up to an advanced level and everything in between. And it is also entirely WIOA aligned, as you can see, with all of the abilities to target uh, career pathways, all of the common measures of WIOA, from getting a job, keeping a job, prep for the uh, integration of education and training in all of its forms, uh, including getting students ready for certificated programs. But of course, where we really shine and, and stand out, and as you hear Jen speak, is we offer amazing uh, you know, touch of a button, in-class projectable lessons for everything that a teacher would need, that busy teacher with very little preparation time, or an experienced teacher can integrate seamlessly everything that students will see in uh, the computer program working in labs or at a distance with what they will be uh, exposed to in the class. They have, the teachers have uh, ability to, to print worksheets on demand and it, once again, everything is seamlessly uh, connected with what learners will be doing, uh, learning at a distance and at a lab, as well as the ability to learn on the go with a mobile friendly. So, uh, again, to find out more about all the powerful things that uh, Burlington English can provide uh, for teachers, for administrators, and make life very, very easy in this uh, WIOA world, uh, take a look at burlingtonenglish.com slash contact, and uh, I will see you all in a few minutes at the end of uh, Jen's presentation. So, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jen. Thanks so much. Appreciate you. Hi, thank you, Robert. Nice to um, be online with everybody here. Um, and welcome to the webinar. I am going to stop my video while I'm talking and then come back to you again at the, um, at the end. Um, so just give me a second while I share my screen. And I will move to 
the presentation mode. Okay, great. So, as R Robert said, I am Jan Vanek. I am the director of Ideal Consortium, which is a project of the EdTech Center at World Ed. Our sole purpose, my sole purpose in my work um, with Ideal Consortium is to serve as a facilitator and provide professional development and technical support to um, ABE programs across the country as they work to initially create or improve currently existing distance and blended learning programs. Um, we work at the, mostly with state level leaders and state level PD directors, and then certainly work with lead teachers also. So more about Ideal Consortium at the end um, of the webinar. Uh, what we're going to do today, I'll just, by way of introduction, I'll just say a little bit more about my work, then frame an issue, I think the reason that has brought you all here. I'm going to talk about some, of, some research that I'm familiar with from my own work, and then also research directly from Ideal Consortium Member States on, on how to support persistence with quality programming and distance and blended learning. Um, I'll give you a few links to resources that you can use immediately and then give you some ideas for how you might plan um, support for this next coming school year. And then we'll end with some questions. Uh, just a little note, um, that I have actually integrated, so tried to integrate some interaction into this exchange. Um, so it, when queued, if um, you have responses to some of the prompts I'm gonna provide, I encourage you to chat them. You can reach chat by clicking on those uh, up in the right hand corner of your screen you might see your zoom toolbar and you can find chat there um, I'm going to be supported in this and, and um, my the, my colleagues here will will let me know if there's a chat message that's come in so let's start off with some of this um, I, I'd like for you we don't necessarily need to share out all of this but to sort of focus your attention when we're going through this webinar um, I'd like you to just make note of a question that you might have about distance and blended learning um, and about how to best support your learners. Um, you can think if you're a teacher, you can think at the classroom level. If you're a program leader, you can think at the admin level. Um, and so feel free to just hang on to that question or if you want to, you can actually put it in the Q&A. And we'll return, I'm going to ask you to return to your question at the end of the webinar to see how well I did in addressing the question. All right, so as we know, um, this issue that, that our learners are living with and that some and teachers too are living with is that technology abounds. And this can be a very promising reality and it can also be a complicating reality. Uh, essentially, what we need is for programs across the U.S. to be able to best support their currently enrolled learners with um, quality distance and blended learning opportunities so that learners are able to, uh, you know, use the support of the program when they're, when they're enrolled to be able to learn some technology skills and digital literacy that will help them later in life and in the other aspects of their life. I'm sure you're all familiar with the PIOC Survey of Adult Skills. Um, 5,000 adults in the US were interviewed, approximately 5,000 adults in 23 other countries were also, also completed the survey. And uh, one of the interesting um, surveys dealt with how you use technology in problem solving. Um, of the 5,000 adults who completed the survey, only 15 or well, 15 percent of those 5,000 couldn't even take this problem-solving survey because it was entirely online and they'd had no experience getting online of the adults who did take it 15.8 uh, percent scored below level one which is the lowest level that was the highest percentage of level one um, learner or adults in any of the countries that were surveyed uh, and even interestingly, 58% um, of millennials who participated in this study uh, tested at the lowest skill level, despite reporting that they spent 35 hours a week online using digital media or social media. Um, so, you know, this, this is fairly problematic if we consider how important it is for um, our learners to have digital literacy so that they can persist or enter into college, the college setting, and persist and succeed in, in their work 
workplace. So this is what brings me, this is what motivates me and puts fire under, you know, under my fingertips at my keyboard. This is what keeps me engaged in the work. And I assume that this is a reality shared by many of you too. Hi, Chad. So, yeah. You have a quick question. Sure. What are some of the ways you can help DL students with a sense of belonging and community? Okay. Um, I'm going to thank you so much for sharing that question. I'm, I am uh, going to understand that, that w that's a prompt for a question we're hanging on to. And I want you guys to hold me accountable to coming back to that. I think we'll get to the answer when I'm in the rest of the presentation. Um, so I guess one word though, I would say keep it interactive and engaging and create a, op offer opportunities to create a sense of community. And I'll pro provide some exact um, uh, exam I'll, I'll provide some more examples of that to, in, the, in a few minutes. But as before I go on now, I'd like you to ask yourself, um, if you can name some characteristics of quality programming, quality education programming, so you can think narrowly about quality programming and distance, and distance learning or blended learning, or more broadly, just what are some things that we know we need to provide learners in, um, in, our, in their learning? Um, I'm just going to pull up the chat. Um, I'm wondering if anybody is willing to chat some characteristics that they're thinking of. Um, feel free to do that. Again, the chat button is under the three dots. Um, yes, yeah, so I see one here. Pro program is adaptive to individual needs. That's, a, that's exactly right. Personalized learning is a very important part of persistence, especially when we're working with online learning and online technologies. We see user-friendly as an important quality. Yeah, these are all excellent ideas. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to share a few of the ideas that I've come to um, understand. Over, you know, I've I've taught adult, adult uh, particularly adult ESL for over 20 years, and basically every program type of program you can imagine, um, and. And, and then I've you know, recently completed my doctoral research and done some research on my own. So um, these are some of the things that I understand. Um, most important is that quality programming is the result of an intentional process um, where you start off by reflecting and understanding the needs of your learners and the resources that you have available as a teacher. Um, and then you investigate to make sure you understand your state policy, your program policies, Anything that's going to guide your implementation um, and use of those resources that, that you've determined your, your learners need to connect with. And then, most important, especially if you're brand new to this work or you're looking to revamp an, 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 an existing blended or distance learning program, is that you take an experimental approach. And you start by choosing a model, intentionally thinking about what that model looks like, choose a targeted group of learners, choose a core online curriculum, and start gathering any of the supplemental resources that you might need to support implementation for your learners. Another thing, so, so in this first, this first step, you know, deciding exactly what it is we're doing here, um, it's really important to understand whether or not you're doing distance learning or blended learning, because in the implementation and the type of support that you're going to need to provide your learners is quite is quite different. Um, this is a definition of distance learning that comes from the NRS, and it's it's virtually I think in, important to note it's virtually unchanged since it was initially published in the first guidelines in the in like 2008 I think it was. Um, so this is a formal learning activities where teachers and instructors are separated by geography, time, or both for a majority of the instructional period. The materials are delivered through a variety of media, um, including print, audio, video, broadcasts, computers, web-based programs, um, and teachers might use a range of means by which to communicate, maybe email, telephone, or online technologies um, like Skype or Google Hangout, or even um, a webinar tool like Zoom. Um, often in distance learning programs, learners come in in person, they have to pre-test, then they come in again in person to post-test. But there might be very little face-to-face -face contact in between. As opposed to blended learning, um, <coughs> where there is online learning that happens synced to what learners are doing in a classroom. 
Uh, this is a definition. So I'm going to throw out a bunch of definitions here. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that your blended learning program needs to look specifically like these definitions. We all know that we work in very different contexts. And because of that, you might be thinking about what bl blended looks like a little bit differently. Um, but this definition actually comes from K-12, and there, there's been a lot of research in K-12 on the best ways to approach blended learning. Um, and this, I think this definition works. So it's, it's formal. That's important to know. It's a formal education program where part of the instruction is online. And there's some element that student, of student control over time, place, path, and or pace. So this is that individual aspect or personalized aspect, um, the uh, characteristic that one of the, our, our participants online here mentioned earlier. Um, so they're not necessarily just following the clicks that are assigned to them, but there's some sort of either the online curriculum affords some personalization and um, opportunities for learners to do some independent um, self-guidance, um, or there's some means by which you can bring that into your program. Um, some of it is in the brick and mortar location. Um, and the modalities are integrated. So in blended learning, the modalities are integrated. So you've got the online work and what's happening in the classroom supporting each other. If you are, I'm not going to get too deeply into this, but if, if the definition from the Christensen Institute fascinated you, I would recommend checking out this link down here. Um, and you, you know, feel free to chat the link if any, any, um, if you would like to, so that it's available to participants in the chat. Um, but this, they, the Christensen model actually, uh, Christensen broke, did a lot of research, classroom research, and actually broke down different types of um, implementation models. And so I encourage you, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just know this is, I think this slide is nice because it reminds us that there are many different ways to approach this work. And there's been research supporting different models available. So I encourage you to check out the Christensen Institute website and there, watch some videos that describe um, how these different models play out in the, in the classroom. I want to throw one more definition um, at your way. This is very recent research. It's one of the largest bodies of research on blended learning in adult learner classrooms by Bob Murphy and colleagues um, when uh, Bob was at SRI. This was just published earlier or late last year. And he, in his research, found that um, there, was, there, there was this thing called blended learning. And the, thing, the most important thing about blended learning is a tight integration of online curriculum and resources into a broader curriculum that also has a face-to-face -face component. And the important thing here is that uh, uh, instructors consciously linked the content that was happening in the classroom to what they knew learners were doing online and that those things reinforced each other. Versus hybrid, where there is also face-to-face -face work and then there's online work, but they're not necessarily connected to each other. It might just be a way to intensify learning or to help learners get to their 40 hours before, or whatever it is, the number of hours before their NRS testing. But the online work doesn't necessarily impact what's happening in the classroom. And then, the, and then um, the, in, the Murphy et al. found that there was this no, another way to, to think about this in suppl as supplemental online learning. And unlike blended and hybrid, the online work was not necessarily required. It might just be something extra that learners are doing. So just pause for a second. And if you are doing some kind of blended learning in your classroom, um, which, which one of these things do you think you might be doing? I mean, just, just take a second and think through it. And maybe you don't fit necessarily here um, in, this, in this continuum. I know um, uh, John Stevenson, who is um, for the Tech Texas Workforce Commission, we've, we've talked about it. He, in Texas, they have a model of hybrid learning where a learner might sit and be in class for, um, regularly for several weeks and then work online for several weeks because they can't get in. Um, and that, that would definitely be a hybrid model, it, although they're not happening at the same time. They're happening sequentially, and the learner's getting credit for both of them. So there's lots of, lots of different ways to think about this. Um, one of the, um, let's see, I'm just, I'm just going to pause here and check out some of the chats. Um, let's see, can I post the research by Murphy? 
Yes. Um, let's find a way. I actually have got that. I've linked to that in several places, and I can we can make sure we get that to you, Penny. Or maybe we can send out a thank you note to everybody and send some of the links that have been requested here. Oh, Tiffany, and Tiffany, I see Tiffany Lee has just presented a link to the blended learning models, and I'll get the SRI study out to you guys too. Um, Here's another interesting way of thinking about this. Um, at the EdTech Center at World Ed, we're starting to try to look for tangible examples of different ways to approach blended learning. And um, these are some very interesting models that have um, come to our attention in the last year or so. And you can see, if you just look on the right here, we've classified the percent, like sort of visually classified the percentage of, of online versus in class um, in a picture. So um, many of you um, might be familiar with some of these models. Um, I'll just jump in in the middle here. And so for example, English Now is a very interesting model that's um, based on learning circles, peer-to-peer -peer learning circles um, being implemented in New England and very successfully, I would say, in the in RyeFly, which is the Rhode Island um, Family Literacy work um, through the Rhode Island Public Library Systems, or the Providence Public Library Systems. Um, and they are using online resources like USA Learns, Burlington English, and, and others, um, where, with a tutor leading peer learning. So the learners are all there with their tablets that have been given to them. And they're working independently, but checking in with each other and having a, a volunteer or a teacher there to support them. Um, so English Now, RyeFly is using English Now as a way to have people start learning before they can enroll in face-to-face -face classes. Uh, another really fascinating example I'll just call to your attention quickly is English Innovations work. It's a formerly Gates Foundation project where learners are given Chromebooks or laptops and they work in um, with community organizations to both study English and work on civic engagement um, issues. So they're, they're learning English as they're involved in civic engagement work and social justice work and they're also learning digital literacy skills because they're doing this as blended learning. Um, some of the English innovations projects across the country have people um, creating digital, digital storytelling works and posting them and having learners discuss them, as well as using um, uh, the proprietary curricula from, from publishers. So it's a, that's another very interesting project um, and that would, could be considered a blended learning program. Um, I'll also note Mobile Up, which is um, a pro program in California for people who can't quit get to the classroom, and for learners who don't have access to cell phones, um, they're using cell. Or, um, sorry, uh, smartphones. They're they're using cell ed is using cell phones as a way to do English language learning through text and audio available on any phone line. Um, they don't need a smartphone. All they need is a regular plan. So. I feel feel free to just do a web search if you want to read into any more of these models, and um, you can actually download a PDF of this by going to the link that you see on the page here. All right, before I continue, I want to make sure that I don't there aren't any questions I should respond to right now, or if there's anything in the chat that you guys want me to address that I haven't seen. Okay, so um, I hope from, from what I've shared already that you understand that distance and blended learning are not monolithic concepts, that they look different no matter, you know, depending on where you're work, working, the resources available to you, who your learners are, um, and, um, you know, how many teachers are involved in, 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 the, in, in uh, the program. Uh, but there, there is work that is consistent that, you know, even though the program models might actually look different, there is work that can be assumed to be the same no matter where you are. And that is that you need an intentional process um, as you're developing or as you're updating whatever program you provide to your learners. Um, and this is, this is the work of the ideal consortium. We take um, program leaders and lead teachers and ed tech specialists through the process of 
setting up or conceptualizing their distance learning program with respect to all of these categories that you see here. So it's not just buying a access to a quality program. Um, it's also all this other stuff. Um, without all, this, all these other components of implementation, um, even the most beautiful, most easily um, naviga navigated online tool is, is going to have a hard time succeeding um, because you need infrastructure to make that tool work. Um, so, for example, we need, we need to consciously get started, take stock of current learning opportunities, resources, and the students you're working with. And then you need to start at the very beginning thinking about those things and defining who is, who is it you're going to recruit to this program that you've decided to implement or, or enhance. Decide who they are. You know, are they, are you going to start, are you going to focus on English language learners? Are you going to focus on higher level adult career pathway students? Where am I going to find them? Um, and what, what means by which will I find them? Am I going to reach out through social media? Um, am I going to post flyers at the workforce centers, um, at the library? Do we go into classrooms and recruit teachers? Um, to find students that they think would be will, uh, you succeed in blended learning. And then once you do all that recruiting, then you need to figure out a way how to screen in people who are actually ready. Throwing a learner who's not ready, for, especially if we're talking about a distance learning program, who's not ready to work independently and doesn't have access to a computer and you don't have access to support getting them a computer, you know, you need, you need to find alternatives for learners who aren't quite ready. And then um, through orientation, you know, you, you need to set up expectations and show learners um, how to get into this tool um, and make sure they have a solid foundation on which to start before you actually start thinking about instruction. So um, I'm going to step through each of those setup phases and provide a little bit more example, uh, provide some examples um, about the different components that are required for success in each of these areas. So let's go back and we'll start with recruitment here. So you need to find the right learners and you need to know where to look for them. Um, it's really good, especially if you're getting started, to think of a targeted learning opportunity and a targeted learning community and focus your program on serving that specific group initially. Then as you develop the infrastructure to do implementation of distance or blended learning more broadly, you can expand that net and create and broaden your programming to reach other learners. But it's really, I think, important to be focused on a group, one type of group or one type of learner early on. Um, you need to identify the characteristic skills and the proficiencies of the, you know, of the typical learner who would succeed, and then think about how you're going to find them. After you find them, you need to do some screening. So you need to make sure that the learner skills, the demands of the technology that you're using, and the support that you have available are all aligned so that you're able to reach learners who are right here in the middle of this Venn diagram. Um, this is a finding from um, a study by Heidi silver Picky and Steve Reeder in 2008. They asked the question, what's the minimum level of digital literacy required for someone to learn online? And they, based, they found that essentially anyone can learn online if given an equitable distribution across these three components. So, you know, where their skills might fall short, there's, it might be an easier program to use and there might be more support available. Um, if, if there isn't that much support available, then you need to have learners who have slightly higher skill. Um, so you just are constantly looking, if you think about these three components as three legs of a stool, you need to think about ways to, of keeping that stool level. Um, and there are a number of different screenings that you, that you can do. You can have a survey. I know of progr programs that will um, have an application of, of sort through a Google form online. And if, if someone has the digital literacy skills to fill out that form, they're ready for distance learning. Um, um, uh, my colleague Adam Kiefer at St. Paul, in St. Paul Adult Basic Ed, has people express a, a request for information online or through um, email. And if people can email him or email a confirmation that they're interested, then he, then he knows they're ready to go. So the, the point is to have some sort of focused step that helps you figure out that the students have digital literacy, the soft skills, sort of habits of mind that they are able to um, employ to succeed in, in distance learning. All right. 
after you do that, then you need to provide an orientation. This is, this, um, this is some of the most, I think, telling research that was done in the early Project Ideal years. Um, Jerry Johnston started Project Ideal at the University of Michigan in 2002, and in some of the most early research, he found that the best thing a program can do to support persistence and dis distance and blended learning is to provide a solid orientation where learners are not only given a chance to click through the online resource they're going to be using for their distance learning, um, but also have the opportunity to do some goal, goal setting and planning um, and get oriented to the curricula, of course. We also want to make sure that the learn they have, um, you could have some sort of documentation of the, the work that you're doing together. So they'll, they'll, they'll actually document the expectations. Um, at this particular ABE site, the expectation is four hours a week online. Um, you can see this is a dated form because they're still showing skills tutor here. But it, it's a nice example of what um, a learner would, what it looks like for a learner to make a promise. And then also you'll see down here at the bottom, it actually articulates what the, what the learner can expect from the teacher. And I have one more example here. This is another distance learning contract. And it's also an information a place for the learner to keep some information. Um, you know, the teacher's contact information, the best way to contact. Um, essentially having something that, like this just solidifies the expectations and it clears up any ambiguity so the learner knows what to expect from the teacher and of themselves. So after you have, um, so let's just pause here. I'm wondering if you guys can think now, um, what is it, if anything, are you doing in these areas? Um, have you gotten started? If so, do you have focused recruitment? Do you provide some sort of screening and orientation to the, to the learners that you have recruited? So feel free to pause and just think, it, think about what you're doing in these areas. And if you'd like to throw some um, comments in the chat, please do. And maybe you're thinking, oh wow, we don't really have an orientation because we just do blended learning. I would argue that or an orientation is equally important in a blended learning scenario because you're having learners work differently from the way they might have worked before. So you need to consider whether or not you're going to have a learner in a, in a classroom, a blended learning classroom, um, work two hours a week online or is the expectation higher? Um, are they going to be, um, are they going to have the digital literacy skills that they need to succeed in an online class? Um, the online part of their hybrid or blended learning class. If not, do you have a computer lab where they can go work and maybe have the support of a tutor? So you can see how all of these setup components are really important to supporting the, um, the persistence of the learners down the road. Hi, Jen. You have Hi. a couple of responses in your chat. Yeah, I'm, t I'm, just, I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm seeing that we do, so there's some testing, of course, that happens. And it's the testing, of course, is very important to understanding their proficiency and their and the skill levels, their academic skill levels. And I see too that there are some there's some screening happening here. Um, so I think you know it, these things are all really important. Um, and me and in, 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 in you know it used together with some of the other ideas that I've thrown out here um, can really can help to set, support your learners. So I encourage you to check out some of the ideas that, that I see your peers are chatting here. All right, so finally we are to the point of the implementation area that I think a lot of people just assume is the only one sometimes. And um, so I, I hope that I've convinced you that it's important to have a hearty recruitment, screening, and orientation procedures in place. But that it's also important for you to make sure that you're that the once the learners are in, so you find the right learners, but then you also have some strategies in place to make the most of their time while they're in distance learning. And so I'd suggest these three things on your screen right here are very important. You need teachers need to really know the proprietary online curricula that, that's been chosen. Um, often they don't choose their own. Um, it's maybe purchased, actually I know Minnesota uses Burlington English, it's purchased at, by the State Department of Education and all teachers have access to it. 
Um, but it's really important for programs to make sure that teachers have time to dig into that rich curricula to figure out exactly how to make best use of it in their teaching. Um, learners also, our teachers also in this work need to have scheduled time to plan, especially if they're doing blended learning for the first time, figuring out how to sync those resources. Um, I know Robert said this happens fairly seamlessly in Burlington English, but still, I mean, if you can imagine, teachers might need some time to, to, to get their head around. How, how to use this all together to best support their learners. And then teachers also need to be able to know exactly what's expected of them with respect to communicating with learners. So basically we're setting up teachers for success when they have some time to do this work. Understanding that especially teachers new to distance and blended might need some additional time to figure out how to best use the technologies available to them and to figure out how to communicate with their learners. Um, I also want to to, to throw out um, a, a, an argument here that keeping um, teachers engaged online with the online part of the blending learning doesn't necessarily just mean monitoring the admin portal of whatever software tool they're working on. Um, this is actually something that we learned in um, some research that I was involved with, in, with Jerry Johnston, Cheryl Hart from Arizona, and Destiny Long from Pennsylvania, we um, inter basically we each interviewed five to ten teachers, distance and blended learning teachers, in our states who we knew um, to be providing effective instruction. And teachers who, who were experiencing sort of better than average persistence and success with their, with their distance or blended students. And we found that we, these teachers that, that we talked with um, were practicing what we called involved instruction, meaning they had an online tool, but and they were certainly monitoring it, and they were certainly going into the admin of the online curriculum, but they were also doing these other things. So these were the common characteristics. They made use of one primary online curriculum for the group of students they were working with. Um, we found teachers said that when they tried to bring in more than one big curriculum, it got really confusing and it was really hard to actually learn how to use more than one really well. So they chose one primary for, 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 um, for a particular group of students. The other thing they did was to, where, where that curriculum um, didn't necessarily always align with what they needed, they would, they would find open education resources, stuff online, talking with other teachers, they, they would find some ways to supplement the materials that, they, that were available in that primary online curriculum. And then they would take all of these things, so number one and number two, and they would coordinate use of it in a website. So they'd make, uh, they'd use Wix or Weebly, or maybe their school had a website and they had a page. And they'd store all of the links to, all, to the things that they knew they wanted their learners to use all in one place in an online website. The other thing that, that these programs did and these teachers had access to was an on-site lab so that if learners had problems navigating any of the online resources, they could go do their distance, like I'm doing scare quotes here with air quotes, um, distance work in these labs. So they weren't actually working with the teachers in the labs, there were tutors there that could help them. They also, the, the, they really believed in a blended learning model. They felt it both, both intensified instruction and it supported differentiation so that the learners could be working online and independently on the stuff that required more differentiated instruction um, than, than the teachers could maybe provide in the classroom. And then, very important, the teachers that we talked to all considered themselves to be on uh, lifelong learners. So they were the teachers that you, that you see um, you know, on webinars like this. <laughs> so you're, there you go. Um, they're trying out new tools, new apps, working really hard to make sure that as technology changes, they're coasting along the crest of the wave and are able to bring their learners into changes too. Um, so this report is actually um, posted, if you're interested, at this website here. Um, it's, it's a great report because it, it links to a lot of very useful resources. All of the resources that these teachers said they were using are linked in here. And though, um, you know, in the age of ed tech, 2015 is starting to get a little old, um, uh, many of these resources are still available and still free. Um, and I encourage you to check them out. So um, let's just pause again. Um, 
if this were a classroom setting or a conference setting, this is where I'd have you break into some groups. Um, but just to pause and let you reflect a little bit, um, how you see the elements of involved instruction here in the middle. Um, you know, which of these things are you doing already? Are you making, are you just using, are you focusing on one primary curriculum? Do you bring in supplemental resources? Do you have some sort of web home base, digital home base or website in which to um, post all these things? Do you have labs? Do you do blended learning? Um, and do you, you know, what are you doing to make sure that, you, you know, besides hanging on to this, this webinar, you could even say, hey, I, 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 I chime in on webinars like this. Um, you know, what are these, what are these are, you, are you doing? And if you're not doing any of them, um, where do you think, what, what, what do you think you can engage in to push, to push your work forward a little bit? I'm glad to see several teachers are saying here that they use all of this stuff already, and that's, that's just great. And there's a question here, what type of on-site labs? Um, this is from Amanda. Amanda, I'm talking about computer labs. Um, where students can go in and have access to a computer just to do independent work. So not necessarily computer workshops, but like just open lab. I see that uh, Tina Hyde uses Google Classrooms to bring all the resources together. That's a very rich and rich environment where you can link to activities and create your own, your own curriculum. That's great. Um, you know, if you don't have an on-site lab, um, one of the teachers that we interviewed um, for the, the project didn't have an on-site lab either, but she, um, she wrote a grant and she was able to get Chromebooks for her program. So sometimes when you don't have access to the technologies that you think would make, would best support the learning that you're the teaching you're doing, sometimes thinking a little bit creatively, doing a little bit, doing some grant writing, and um, bringing in the resources that you need. It, it, it does happen. It really does happen. It, it, people have been successful with that kind of thing. All right, so let me push on here. The final area of implementation, of course, is assessment. Um, and you want to make sure that you have ample opportunities to assess learners in different ways. Um, we know that learners have different learning styles and might be able to interact to different, in, you know, in different degrees um, it, with using technology. So particularly when you're doing technology-based assessment, it's important to have more than one way to make sure your learners are understanding what they're, what they're supposed to be understanding. Um, so in, in ideal, we recommend that you use some of the things that you see here. Um, you, there's portfolio assessment you can do. You can use the online curriculum tests in the, the online curriculum you might be using. You might create some of your own, either delivered in person or through um, something, a, a mechanism online like Quizlet. Um, you know, you're also going to be doing some formative assessment that is ongoing, checking in kinds of assessment with learners when they're in your classroom. And then, of course, you have, we have the NRS testing that, that happens. Um, very important for both distance and blended learning as it is in face-to-face -face learning. Um, without NRS testing, it's not possible to claim, if you're claiming practice contact hours for the time your learners spend online, you, you, you just can't do it. So you need, you need to get, do that NRS testing, the post-testing for your distance learners too, so that you can show their gains um, and, make you, and you know, have, that, have that be an outcome for your programs. Um, so there are a number of different ways um, to monitor the types of uh, work that you're doing. So you could um, create some tracking forms where you're keeping track of the types of assessment, including the um, you know, NRS testing or TABE testing, and then keeping track of all the different assess assessment measures that you um, are, are using with your learners. Um, I think that over time you develop a sense of the different types of assessment that work well with different learners, um, and you can feel comfortable that you're getting all the knowledge, you're building all the knowledge you need to have about what your learners can do. Uh, so I'm curious, we'll just pause again, which of these assessment mechanisms are you using in your distance or blended learning programs right now?
So we've got all of them. We've got some the online curriculum. Oh, and, and I see here Karen Miller says that they have a database that they use to track all of this assessment stuff. That's great. Really important to have a database to record into, uh, assessments. And um, also interesting, a lot of successful programs use a database to, to track contacts with learners so that over time you're able to understand the best way to contact, certain, to contact learners and how much teacher time is required and how many t different types of outreach are required in order to support persistence. So tracking all of this information, while it might seem onerous to set up, is very important for you so that you can develop an efficiently running program that best supports your learners, but also um, is, you know, the, the budget of the program reflects the actual time and the teacher work that, that's happening. Um, interestingly, um, you, might find, you might find interesting in Minnesota, we have um, um, an adult standard diploma, which is out, it's not, um, credit recovery, and it's not a GED. It's a way that learners can use portfolio to demonstrate competency um, and then um, get their diploma. So portfolios are sort of taking off in Minnesota as a way to um, have completion, to support completion too. Okay, so I have thrown a lot of information at you. And I understand if your head is spinning a little bit. Um, what I would like to do is let you know that um, if you go to uh, the ideal, oops, sorry, the ideal website. So you go to World Ed, uh, the EdTech Center at dot World Ed. Um, you can then um, find information about Ideal, including a link to this PDF. Um, and there was a link actually earlier on the earlier slide where I first showed this, this um, the, the Ideal Distance Learning Handbook. Um, all of the things that I just spelled out to you are written about in this handbook and we are sharing it um, freely with anybody who wants to, to click through it. Um, I'll also tell you that um, states who join the Ideal Consortium um, are, have access to a fully developed nine month long implementation program and support. It's called Ideal 101. It's kind of like a course, but phase one is the part that's actually like a course where uh, together we read a chapter in the handbook and then um, have some online discussion. And then programs, like so a teacher and an admin, let's say, at any program would complete an activity together and at the end of six weeks of this work, the final project is a written pilot, uh, pilot plan that your program can use to um, integrate or start or, or revise their blended and distance learning um, offerings. Um, and then in the second phase, over the course of, let's say, like the spring semester, uh, you actually get support pilot implementing that plan. So with monthly webinars, we check in with you to see how your recruitment phase is going or how your screening and orientation are going or how your instruction is going. Um, so yes, the, the handbook is freely online. Anybody can check it out. Um, and then I encourage you to check out um, um, getting some support and access to IDEO 101, joining the consortium so that we can help you in this work and help you build your distance learning programs. Uh, there are some other courses that are available for states that join Ideal Consortium. We have a number of self-paced special topics courses. These are like two to three hours long. Um, they're not cohort-based, so teachers can just use the link um, and um, learn about how to get started with blended learning, mobile learning, or using or, um, open education resources. We also offer some advanced study groups for folks who have um, mature distance learning, pro distance learning programs or blended learning programs. And um, we work with people on to, to write case studies and then um, uh, folks from across the country might, might engage in discussion about problems they're having with either administrative issues or um, instructional issues. All right, so I think perhaps, oh, I'll just show you one more thing and then I'll get to some questions. Um, this is just an example. We use Moodle um, 
at the Ed Tech Center at World Ed, and um, I see Penny's online. So this is a screenshot for the Idea 101 cohort that I ran for um, OTAN um, on uh, on behalf of OTAN last last year. So I worked with a group of teachers from all across the state of California. They all wrote site plans following the sequence that I've been mapping out through this webinar, and um, they're implementing them this year. Okay. So let me just say, um, again, Ideal Consortium membership is um, available um, at the, it's generally at the state level, although we do have um, one adult basic ed consortium in Northeast, Mi Northwest Michigan who, that's joined. Um, we are in talks with other entities like trade unions about joining. And so I would encourage you, if you are a program administrator or somebody who works at the state level and you're interested in getting some support through this work, to check out the, um, the, the, the information about I Ideal Consortium online um, and you know, reach out to me if you have any questions about how to become a member. Okay, so we have um, about seven minutes left. I'd like you to go back to your initial, initial question and see if, see if I answered it. And then at the same time, I am going to pull up the chat. Um, oh, and thanks, Penny. Penny says her, her um, cohort that went through 101 is doing quite well. Um, and Don says it's great you're bringing back DL 101 that used to be required before in New Mexico. And Don, let's talk again. I would love to see Mexico um, brought back into the ideal work. Um, so yes, we brought it back, but we have also completely updated it. So one of the things you'll notice that um, Jerry's still a named author in the current handbook, but Destiny Simpson and I completely rewrote it and updated it to include um, how to support blended learning programs in a way in a way that wasn't reflected when the last edition was published because it was published in you know, like 2008. So it's all new materials and then we've updated the course as well. Um, okay, I would love to be pointed in the direction of some questions that I should answer. Uh, where can I find more information on targeted recruitment? Um, I think what I'm gonna do is, I would suggest reading the chapter in the handbook um, because it has links to many different um, resources. Um, so, so check out the hand, handbook, and if, if the, uh, I would go to, go to the website and check out the handbook, and you'll be able to find a link to a whole chapter on recruitment that will have um, some more global information about recruitment, but then also some specific ideas. Um, I'm facilitating a group in Maryland right now, and um, one of the programs that I'm supporting is going to be using uh, YouTube uh, broadcasts as a way to recruit for their distance learning programs. So every, every time I run Idea 101, we have um, people that are integrating new technologies and affordances of um, the internet in order to, to, to shift their, their, their recruitment so that they're reading, um, they're me able to meet the needs of their learners. Um, let's see, would love recommendations for funding sources for beginning a hybrid program outside of state and federal funding. Um, Kelsey, I would say you could check into, it's, it's, a lot of this funding is really local, and you might have local corporate foundations, especially those that are engaged in technology work. Um, Dollar General is always a good place to look for some ideas about adult learning and funding. But um, I would start having conversations with local, locally and doing some, some search there. I do know that I'll have access to this chat and, and the Q&As, so um, I can, and I can take some time to read through these things, read through the log, and try to um, respond to some of these questions that, that I haven't gotten to so far. Okay, so again, some important links. This is how you email me if you have any questions. Um, this is the link to where you can, where, to the Ideal Consortium page at the Ed Tech Center um, at World Ed. Um, I am just gearing up for the new program year and um, we'll be making calls, recruiting new states. We have 11 states involved this year. We typically have between like eight and 14 states. Um, 
And the um, leaders from the state get together at a meeting in Boston in August, and then I keep everybody connected through webinars and a community of practice. So even if you don't need the PD and you want support in this impl implementation and in program improvement, um, there's a community of practice level of membership that's been very useful for many programs. Um, and it just makes it so you don't have to reinvent the wheel or solve problems that everybody has already been um, thinking about. All right, so with that, um, we have a about four minutes left. I think I will turn it back over to Robert. And I should I unshare my screen, Robert? Uh, I think I've I think I've got it. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jen. I know I learned a lot, and uh, thanks to the the amazing amount of participants who joined in. So just uh, before we turn it back over to Jen for. Uh, a little Q&A there. I uh, just wanted to share again that Burlington English uh, really provides for you with all this, uh, all these new amazing things, relatively new amazing things that Jen is talking about and this, all this integration. Wouldn't it be neat to have so many things in one place make, uh, make at least one part of it so much easier and that's what Burlington allows you to do all the way from, from basics all the way to upper level and all the integration of WIOA, citizenship, the IELCE, all parts of integration, education, and training all in one place. Um, and again, where we really shine is, again, giving teachers everything that they need for the classroom, a year's worth of projectable lessons at the touch of a button, and everything, again, from worksheets as well as everything students are going to see, whether they're learning at a distance or whether they're learning in a lab, all in one place makes your job so much easier as you're working through all those other implementation uh, and ongoing steps that Jen talked about. So with that, uh, again, just want to invite you all. Uh, we have um, uh, folks in every part of the U.S. Uh, who can get you more information. And so go to us at www.burlingtonenglish.com slash contact. You can find your local person. You can also email us at info at burlingtonenglish.us. And uh, with that, I thank you. Uh, all the success in blended learning. And now back over to uh, Jen. So thank you, Jen. Yeah, that's thank you, Robert. Yeah, so there was one question I wanted to respond to. I just chatted that um, uh, there are programs um, across the country that are doing some data collection to figure out exactly the best mode for teaching their learners. There's been some excellent um, data coming out of the states of Texas and Arizona and, and um, Minnesota. All have three. They all three states have very robust data collection practices, and. All three of those states have shown that the students engaged in, their, in blended or hybrid learning are the ones that have the best outcomes, the, lo the best, the longest persistence, and the, and the, the most impressive level gains. Um, so uh, while there aren't sort of formal randomized control studies for adult learners, um, adult basic education students, uh, we have this evidence from the state NRS data that shows that blended is really the, the way to go with adult learners. So I don't want to take anybody anybody's time beyond two o'clock. Um, I noticed Michelle let everyone know the slides would be available, and I just want to encourage you to reach out to me um, if you have any more questions. And um, thank you very much for being on the webinar today. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate your time, and thank you, Burlington English, for sponsoring this and making it available to everybody. On behalf of COAB, everybody, the, the resources will be available within 24 hours on our website for you to download. You can also view this webinar if you've missed the beginning of it or want to refer to any resources. Again, feel free to reach out to Jen. She can definitely help you. Everyone, you have a wonderful afternoon. Take care.